So we're in this uh, little series hiking through the book of Revelation. It's not a slow trudge through the book of Revelation. It's, it's hiking at a fast pace. We've covered chapters 1 through 7, and you can review those uh, messages on the internet if you would like to get caught up. And uh, just a little heads up for this morning, we're going to shift into hyperdrive this morning. Uh, or warp speed or whatever it is we call it these days. And we're going to cover chapter 8 all the way through till about chapter 18, maybe 10 chapters this morning. Uh, and don't despair, we'll be done in about a half an hour, so you can set your watch by that and see how close we get to that. Now, here's how we're going to approach these chapters. John Nesbitt wrote a book in the 1980s called Megatrends. Megatrends flew off the bookshelves. It was what everybody was talking about. And the author was doing book signings and talk show interviews all over North America. I, I remember it well when the book came out. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for 60 weeks. The theme of megatrends was a description of the big trends or the the game changers, the megatrends that would shape the world in the future, at least as John Nesbitt understood it. As a matter of fact, the term megatrends is still used to forecast game changers that are foreseen in the near future in our world even today. In fact, the movie Back to the Future, which came out in the 80s, was in the headlines this past week because it was released 20 years ago, and in the movie, Michael J. Fox uh, gets into the DeLorean time machine, and it takes him forward to October 21st, 2015, 20 years ago. So they were talking this week about what megatrends were predicted in the movie Back to the Future and which megatrends did they get right and which megatrends did they get wrong. Well, the book of Revelation, and specifically today's talk, could well be called megatrends. Hal Lindsey used to be fond of saying that, that the book of Revelation is more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper. Because from chapter 8 through chapter 18, I want to show you this morning a handful of megatrends that are going to define and shape the world in the future. So let's jump right in at chapter 8, verse 1. Here's the first megatrend that the Bible, Revelation, describes is going to happen in the future. The first megatrend is that global change is going to accelerate in frequency and intensity. Global changes are going to speed up in frequency and intensity. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. There's a story about a wee boy who read that verse in chapter 8, verse 1, and he said, so there's no women in heaven then, because there's silence in heaven for half an hour, he said. Now that's not nice, and of course that's not true, and I would never, ever tell a joke like that. But up to this point, heaven, from chapter... 1 through 7, heaven has been filled with the loud noises of worship. There has been shouting and loud voices and lots and lots and lots of singing. In fact, at one point John says it was like the sound of many waterfalls. The sounds of heaven were, were ear-splittingly loud. Now for the first time in the book of Revelation... Chapter 8, verse 1, there is silence. First time there's ever been no worship in heaven. It's so silent that the silence is deafening. You can hear a pin drop. It's like the work stoppage on Remembrance Day, November 11th, when 
when everything is silent. This 30 minutes of silence is now going to mark a dramatic shift in the book of Revelation. From here on, things are going to shift into high gear in terms of speed of events and how quickly things are going to happen. For example, time frames are given from chapter 8 forward. For example, in chapter 9, verse 5, the time frame of five months is mentioned. In verse 10 of the same chapter, the same five months is mentioned as a time frame of which a particular ailment is going to lay on people. Chapter 10, verse 6, it says, there will be no more delay. So these regular time frames are mentioned over and over throughout these chapters. Chapter 11, verse 3, Gentiles will trample Jerusalem for 42 months. That's three and a half years for you mathematicians if you want to crunch the numbers. And then two witnesses will prophesy for 1260 days. Again, that's three and a half years less a few days. Twelve. Uh, chapter 12, verse 6, again, the same 1260 days is mentioned. So you get this repetition of time frames, and they're all rel relatively short time frames. For example, chapter 12, verse 12 says, Satan knows that his time is short. So there is an emphasis from chapter 8 forward to brevity of time, there is going to be a compression of time and events being squeezed into, more events being squeezed into a very short period of time. The beast is given authority for 42 months. Again, there's that three and a half years, 1260 days, three and a half years. It keeps repeating over and over and over again. So chapter 8 verse 1, seems to mark the beginning of a very short period of time. In fact, even the half hour that introduces this next segment indicates a shortness of time. Time is measured from this point forward in terms of years, just a few years. And it's measured in terms of months, and it's measured in terms of days, and it's even measured in terms of hours. So, 10 chapters from 8 to 18 are needed to describe what's going to happen in that very short, condensed period of time. So, megatrend number one is that changes are going to accelerate in frequency and intensity. And just to show you the consistency of Scripture, Jesus says exactly the same thing in Matthew chapter 24, verse 8, when Jesus is talking about the signs of His coming. The context is very clear that Jesus is describing events that are going to happen in the future right at the end of time. And here's what Jesus says, all of these signs are the beginning of birth pains or labor pains. Now, what on earth does that mean? Well, I'm not an expert on labor pains. I've never given birth before. I probably don't even need to say that. I don't know how it feels to give birth. Phyllis Diller said, if you men want to know what the pain of childbirth feels like, take your bottom lip and pull it up over the top of your head. That will give you some idea of what birth pain feels like. So I don't know what birth pain feels like, and none of us men know what birth pain feels like. But I do believe that it's very painful. I have been by the side of my dear wife when she has been giving birth four times over now. And I don't think she's planning on having any more. But based on my experience, this is not first-hand experience, you understand, but based on my first-hand experience of watching her experiencing the pain of labor, two things are true of childbirth labor pains. Number one, the closer you get to the birth, the closer the contractions happen. That true? Ladies, help me out. That true? The second thing that's true is that the closer you get to the birth, the more intensive the contractions are. Lynn, that true? So I'm right. 
Two things are true. Number one, the closer you get to the birth, the closer, more frequent the contractions happen. And number two, the closer you get to the birth, the more intensive, the deeper, the, the more painful the contractions become. In other words, they accelerate. Well, that's exactly what Revelation is saying. That is entirely consistent with what the book of Revelation from chapter 8 forward is saying. We would expect a rapid, accelerated changes happening the closer the end gets. And these events are going to happen with greater frequency, just like labor contractions. And they're going to happen with greater intensity. That's an incredibly consistent observation between Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation. And it gives you confidence that this book is a supernatural book. This is God's word. It never makes a mistake. And you can see how quickly things are going to change. Beginning at chapter 8 and moving into chapter 9. John writes down, for example, the descriptions of six judgments. Six trumpet judgments that are going to telescope out of the seventh seal. We talked about the first six seals last week. This is now the seventh seal beginning at chapter 8 verse 1. And out of this seventh seal is going to telescope seven trumpet judgments. And just to give you an overview, the first one is going to affect the ecology of the globe. It's going to affect the landscape of the entire world. A third of all trees, for example, is going to be destroyed in that one judgment. The second trumpet, an asteroid is going to hit the ocean. At least it sounds like an asteroid because here's what John says. Something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. Well, that sounds like an asteroid. And a third of the ocean water is going to be contaminated in an instant. A third of all marine life is going to die. And a third of all ships that are on the water are going to be destroyed, obviously by tidal waves and, and tsunamis. And then third, there's going to be a comet that's going to hit on inland waterways. And a third of all drinking water is going to be undrinkable. And water is going to become scarce. I was just reading this morning um, about a water shortage in many areas of the world right now. And then fourth, daylight is going to be dulled down by one third. Fifth, unleashing of the fifth trumpet, unleashing of demons for a very specific period of time, five months. And the fifth trumpet is going to last for five months. Demons are pictured in chapter 9 as locusts. And they can inflict diseases that people are going to want to die, but they can't die. That's how horrific the... the uh, consequences of the diseases are going to be, and then sick, tragically, a third of the population is going to be killed. So there is population statistics given in these two chapters. But amazingly, people are still going to refuse to repent. People are still going to refuse to turn back to God. We think that climate change is happening quickly. We we track temperature change over the last hundred years and we're afraid that the polar ice caps are melting. We're afraid that glacier ice is receding like a hairline. We're afraid that car exhausts are melting the ozone layer. And we fear that these changes are happening quickly. This is nothing compared to this first gear game changer that's going to happen in the future. In the future, the real game changers are going to happen within hours, within days, within weeks, within months. So that's the first game changer, the first megatrend that, that Revelation describes is that massive global changes are going to happen very, very quickly. The second megatrend is that Israel is going to be at the epicenter of everything. You know what the epicenter is? The epicenter of, a, of an earthquake is the origin of the earthquake, where the, where the, where the, tectonic, the Teutonic plates slip against one another. That's the epicenter. That's the source. That's where an earthquake originates. Well, Revelation says that, that Israel, that tiny little piece of real estate in the Middle East by the Mediterranean, it's going to be the focal point of the entire world. Now, this isn't really a future reality. This is a present reality. Israel is already 
the epicenter of the world in many ways. Let me read for you chapter 11, verse 1 to 6, just to give you an idea here. Then the Apostle John was given a measuring rod like a staff. Now remember, there's a lot of symbolism in the book of Revelation, and there's some symbolism here. And I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. That's a, ref that's a reference to the temple in Jerusalem. And it becomes clear that it's in the city of Jerusalem as we go down. Do not measure the court outside the temple. That's the outer temple. That's the temple. Of, that's the court of the Gentiles in the Old Testament temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they're going to trample the holy city. See, that's a reference to Jerusalem for 42 months. There's our time frame again, three and a half years. And I'm going to grant authority to my two witnesses, and they're going to prophesy for 1260 days. There's our time frame again, three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. Now, I'm not going to take the time this morning to explain who these witnesses are. I'm, going to, I'm hoping I can whet your appetite and your interest and you'll study this a little more on your own. My only interest here is to embed in our minds that the geographical location we're talking about here is Jerusalem in Israel. There are two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anybody would harm these two witnesses, fire will pour from their mouth and consume their foes. If anybody would harm them, this is how he will be doomed to be killed. They have the power, these two witnesses will have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they will have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they finish their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit is going to make war on them and it's going to conquer them and it's going to kill them and their dead bodies are going to lie in the street of the great city. So they're going to lie in the street in Jerusalem. You ask, well, Roy, how do you know for sure that's Jerusalem? Well, let's keep reading. That symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt where the Lord was crucified. Very clear. This is Jerusalem. So change it. So the, the Israel is going to be at the very epicenter of of the future and these events that are going to happen preceding Jesus' second coming. Now, um, in Matthew 24, the disciples were passing that great temple that was built by Herod in Jerusalem. And it was an architectural masterpiece. And they said to Jesus, Jesus, isn't this a magnificent structure? And Jesus said, there's going to come a day, Matthew 24, there's going to come a day when not one stone in this temple is going to be left on top of another one. Jesus is prophesying that the temple of Herod is going to be destroyed. Now that happened 40 years after Jesus said that, in 70 AD. The Romans got fed up with the Jews in Israel, with the trouble they were causing, and the Romans ransacked Israel, ransacked Jerusalem, and they flattened the temple. That happened in 70 AD, historical fact. And they kicked all of the Jews out of Israel, scattered them all over the known world. And there's not one layer of that temple stone left on top of another to this day. The Wailing Wall that stands today in Jerusalem where Jewish people and people from around the world it's one of the biggest tourist attractions when you go to Jerusalem. Uh, Jewish people stand by that wall and they, they write little prayer requests on pieces of paper and they put them into the cracks in the stone. It's the most sacred wall in all of Jerusalem for Jewish people. That wall is not part of the temple. That wall is part of the retaining wall on which the temple was built. So Jesus' words were fulfilled right to the very letter that not one stone will be left on top of another. Now, Israel ceased to be a nation in 70 AD. Jewish people had no homeland since 70 AD. And that all changed in one day in 1948 after what the Jewish people suffered in the Holocaust and the Second World War, when the United Nations voted to give what was then Palestine to the Jewish people and renamed it Israel once again. And that answered Isaiah's question in Isaiah 68, written 
2,700 years ago, Isaiah asked this question. Who has ever heard of such things? Who has ever seen anything like this? Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Answer, yes, in 1948. The church could not understand before 1948 how could Israel ever be a megatrend in the future? How could Israel ever be a player in the future? How could Israel ever be a game changer? And yet Israel today is the very epicenter of that end game. Today the Middle East is the most volatile area of the world. And Israel is right in the eye of the storm. So that's the second mega trend that Revelation describes for us. Here's the third mega trend. Global connectivity. The whole world will be connected. That's described in the book of Revelation. I remember growing up in Belfast when we sent letters to Canada. And it would take weeks for a letter to be delivered to Canada, and it would take more weeks for another return letter, response letter, to make its way back to Ireland again. And when I left Ireland, and after I worked in the shipyard, and then I got a job here in Canada, my pay tripled in one week. I couldn't believe they were paying me so much money. I wanted to take the check back. I thought they'd added an extra zero on my first paycheck by mistake. The disparity in cultures between Belfast and Canada was like living on two different planets. Our countries were not connected in any way, shape, or form. Today, if I compare Ireland with Canada, salaries are similar. House prices, at least where my sister lives, are similar. Clothing styles are similar. Movie choices, music choices are similar. Accents are similar. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> but it's all because of connectivity, because the world is connected, you see. You can Skype almost anybody, anywhere in the world almost, instantaneously. That's a mega trend. Global connectivity. Well, you see this megatrend in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 9. Look what it says. After these two witnesses are killed, their bodies are going to be left in the street for three and a half days. Can you imagine that in the future? That these two bodies are going to be left undisturbed in the street to serve as an example. And look at verse 9. Nations will gaze at the dead bodies. John must have wondered, how on earth can that ever happen? Writing that back in the first century, how can the world gaze on these two bodies lying on a street in Jerusalem? He didn't understand connectivity. Look at chapter 13, verse 3. The whole world marveled as they followed the beast. How can the entire world follow one man? In that world 2,000 years ago, the world was not connected. Parts of the world were because of Roman uh, Pax, because of the Roman peace. But they could never have gotten the entire world to follow one person, but you can today because we've got global connectivity. Look at chapter 13, they, they will, verse 13, they will worship the image of the beast. It's interesting that we call the picture on a TV screen or the picture on a computer screen, what do we call that? An image. An image, Mary, on the screen. In fact, if you Google something, what do you see along the little bar at the top? You've got different options. You can choose web, you can choose news, or you can choose image. It's interesting that the scenarios in Revelation could not happen without global connectivity, without global communication, without, without global instant information. And it's interesting that the image of the beast will be worshipped around the world. Is it possible that there are going to be giant TV screens with the image of this Antichrist that everyone will be forced to bow down and to worship? 
Daniel chapter 11 says, in the last days, knowledge will increase. Daniel said that. Knowledge and information, same thing. Information is increasing in large part because of the synergy that has come from global connectivity because of everybody sharing their knowledge, sharing their information, and then that leads to greater knowledge and greater inventions and greater discoveries. So that's the third megatrend, global connectivity. Here's the fourth megatrend, a unified world. There will be a unified world in the future. There will not be a fractured world. There will not be a world of wars against countries. There is going to be a largely unified world. If you look at chapter 13, you see that very clearly. There's going to be a unifying, very impressive leader. Chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, and you can, the, the beast is mentioned many, many times over in these chapters, and the beast is one who is going to be um, incarnating Satan. Satan will be behind this human person who is going to rise up, and he's going to become a world leader. And there's imagery with him with ten horns, Horns always symbolizes power and seven heads and ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads, which indicates he's going to be an antichrist. He's going to be opposing Christ and everything Jesus stands for. Verse 2, the beast that I saw was like a leopard. He, he, that probably symbolizes just great speed or great power, great endurance. Its feet were like a bear's feet and its mouth was like a lion's mouth and to it the dragon and clearly the dragon in chapter 12 uh, verse 9 is Satan. That great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan. So the dragon is Satan and to it the dragon, Satan, gave his power and his throne and great authority. And one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. And its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So that gives you a clue why the whole world is going to flock after this guy. Because he's going to be seemingly killed. And then he's going to recover. And it's going to look like a resurrection of some sorts. And that's going to get the whole world following after him. He's got great oratory skill. Look at verse 4. They worship the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worship the beast. So this beast is not only a political leader, this beast is going to be a religious leader, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? So this leader is going to bring the entire world together. He's going to unify the world. And so he's going to have a unified religion, and he's going to have a unified military power. Look at 17, verse 13. Chapter 17, verse 13 says, These kings are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. So the kings of the earth, the governments of the earth, are going to hand over their military powers to the authority of this guy who's going to rule the world and he's going to be an impressive leader. He's going to have a unified religion. He's going to have a unified military alliance and he's going to have a, have a unified electronic, economic, cashless currency. Which is a very important element in unifying the world. To unify the currency. Look at chapter 13. 16 to 18. Also it causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, that means everybody, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. That's some kind of an electronic marking device. So that nobody can buy or sell anything unless he has the mark, that is the name of the beast or the number of its name, <laughs> And this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. And theologians, scholars, Bible enthusiasts for centuries have tried to figure out what the 666 means. 
And it's simplest to say that the Bible doesn't tell us what the 666 means, so there's no need to speculate about it. The Bible simply says that this is his name, and perhaps in the future it will become clear what 666 means, but at this point it doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is that he's going to unify the currencies of the world, and it's likely going to be in electronic form, and it's going to be cashless. Nobody's going to be able to buy or sell anything without this mark, which will probably be electronic. And so it's going to be a unified, electronic, economic, cashless currency. By the way, it's interesting to me, when we went to Israel a few years ago, that all of the taxis in Jerusalem, uh, their license plates all begin with 666. Um, I don't know that that means anything, and I'm not supposed, about to speculate that it does. It's just interesting to me that their license plates start with those three figures. Here's the fifth megatrend, and this is the last one. Global gospel proliferation. Right up to the very end, the gospel is going to be proclaimed and proliferated around the globe. Look at chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. In fact, it seems to indicate that the angels take over from humans in the proclamation of the gospel. Look what it says in verse 4, uh, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And so there's going to be a gospel proliferation that is going to continue to spread around the world until the very end. It's not going to stop until the very end. And Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. Jesus said this, this gospel will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. But that doesn't mean it's going to be well received. As a matter of fact, John gets an object lesson in the way the scripture and the gospel are going to be received in chapter 10. He gives us the reason why it's not going to be received. God's word is going to be, it's characterized as being bittersweet. Look at chapter 10, verse 8 and 9, and I'll just finish with this. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me and said, Go, take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and I told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And in the context it's clear that this scroll is God's word. And I think it's safe to assume that this little scroll represents the scripture, the gospel. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth. And one of the reasons why we know this is God's word is because that's exactly what King David called the scripture in Psalm 19. It is honey in my mouth. It is sweet as honey. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. <laughs> And then he was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples, many nations, many languages, and kings. So here's the whole point. This is the reason why the word of God will not be accepted. This is the reason why the scripture will be rejected. This is the reason why the gospel will not be accepted. Same reason why it's always never been accepted, because it's sweet and bitter. That's what the Bible is. It's sweet and it's bitter. It's sweet as honey. Just like King David said in Psalm 19, it's like honey on my lips. And many of us around here could testify to that. We love this book. We delight in this book. 
We rejoice over this book and it is sweet as honey. We love to devour it. We read it every day. We can't get enough of it. And some of us have been reading it for 30, 40, 50, 60 years and you can testify to that. Yeah, this word is a great blessing. This word reveals Christ. It shows us that Christ is worthy and God is compassionate and kind and forgiving and loving and protective and providing and powerful. This word is so sweet. I delight in it. We get that. But, this word is bitter to a lot of people. This word shows us that God is holy and God is righteous and God is the judge of all the earth and that God will punish sin and He will not ignore rebellion and God's patience is not limitless. And God will, in His grace, give warning after warning after warning after warning, and then His judgment falls. You see that all through Scripture. And it's exactly the same pattern at the end. God, in His grace, is going to warn and going to warn and going to warn, and then His judgment is going to fall. And for a lot of people, they find that very, 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 very bitter. Some cultures make a god of their own cho choosing out of wood or stone or metal. And they worship that. And perhaps we think that's a little primitive, but we do exactly the same thing. We craft a god in our own mind of our own choosing. We craft a god in our mind that we like and we worship that. Some people only want part of the God of Scripture, but they don't want all of Him because some of Him seems bitter. There's a little poem that somebody wrote some years ago called Three Dollars Worth of God, Please. And I don't have it words in front of me, but the idea of it was, God, I, I just want three dollars worth of God. I, I don't want enough of you that is going to affect my life. I just want three dollars worth of God that will make me comfortable but not enough to disturb my sleep. That's exactly what John is being told here. This word is bittersweet. Some people come to the Bible with a likability meter. Well, I like this, but I don't like that. You can't do that with Scripture. When you come to Scripture, you can't ask, what do I like and what do I not like? What do I find interesting and what do I not find interesting? The key issue with the Bible is none of those questions. The key issue with the Bible is, is it true? It's not what I like, it's is it true? Because if it's true, then that's a game changer. Then, if it's true, then I must bow the knee and surrender to it. I must read it, I must study it, I must believe it. And most importantly, I must allow it to change my life by walking in obedience to it. You know, in the old days when sailors were out on the sea in a storm, and a storm came, and, and they lost their way, and they didn't know what direction they were going, there was always one place they could look, wasn't there? Where did they look in order to know where they were going? North Star. Because the North Star was a fixed point. The North Star never moved. The North Star could be trusted. It was sure. It was certain. No matter how big the waves, no matter how strong the wind, they always knew that if they looked to the North Star, that and that alone, they could trust. No matter what you're going through today, Maybe there's storms swirling around your life. You're discouraged. You're confused. You're not sure which way is up. <clears throat> there is one North Star. And it is this. I promise you, if you will look to this North Star, you can trust it. It's true. And God went to a lot of trouble to convince you that it was true. He doesn't just ask you to accept it by blind faith.
That's why he wrote the book of Revelation, to let you see that God knew what the mega trends were going to be at the end. And we are perhaps the first generation, maybe the second generation, that is able to see these mega trends actually unfolding. Because I haven't even sort of worked to link. I haven't, as I've gone through these, I haven't said, now, let me show you how these mega trends are working out. I haven't even done that here this morning because I know they're obvious to all of you. Well, God did that so that you would know this is your North Star. And God is saying, just, just look to the North Star. And I promise you, this is true. And I'll get you through whatever it is you're going through. Amen?